بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum and welcome to this weekly webinar with me, the moderator, Sayyid Mahdi Abidi. Uh, now, usually these uh, webinars do take place uh, on uh, 6 p.m. Uh, UK time on Mondays, uh, but uh, because of the uh, clash between the uh, webinar time and the uh, the the Maghrib time, the Salat al-Maghrib time, inshallah, until the 15th of March, uh, these webinars will be taking place uh, at 5 p.m. till 6 p.m., just an hour earlier. Uh, you can still participate in these webinars uh, by joining our, our Zoom chats and, of course, watching us live on the Islamic Center of uh, England's YouTube channel, inshallah. And each week uh, we are joined by esteemed scholars, esteemed guests. And today uh, we are blessed to have Wujit al-Islam wal muslimin Dr. Hussein uh, Latif who's joining us inshallah uh just a quick biography before i uh, give the stage over to uh sheikh latifi uh to take uh over inshallah so sheikh hussein latifi was born and raised in qum and after 10 years of study in the islamic seminary and simultaneous with following advanced islamic jurisprudence and its principles at the Kharij level he continued par- parallel postgraduate studies in the university of tehran and earned an mphil in 2014 and a phd in, in um, uh, 2018 in Western philosophy. In Hausa, he benefited from Atullah Sayyid Ahmed Madadi, Sheikh Mahdi Shabzandadar, and Sayyid Javadi Shabedi Zanjani. And the university in Hausa, he has taught under and postgraduate uh, courses on Islamic theology, history, philosophy, and jurisprudence in Arabic, Farsi, and English, and in his home and abroad countries as well. And from August of 2019 to August to or April of 2022, he served as the visiting lecturer of Islamic studies at the University of Zimbabwe and Arupe Jesui University. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, doctor. Thank you so much for joining me today. <clears throat> wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah, brother. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for having me. Uh, inshallah, you are joining us uh, from Iran. I hope uh, that the internet connection there will not uh, bother us too much uh, in today's webinars. But uh, whenever you're ready, uh, dear doctor, we can uh, begin today, inshallah. Inshallah, let's hope so. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Anbiya wa al-Mursaleen. Muhammadin wa alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. May Allah's peace and blessing be with all the respected brothers and sisters and viewers and listeners. And uh, this is our fifth session on the Contemporary Issue webinar on uh, religion and morality. And before that, I have to uh, express my congratulations on the uh, blessed month of Sha'ban that we uh, are in, uh, the days that passed, the anniversary birthday of Imam Hussein, Imam Sajjad, and Abul Fadl al-Abbas alayhim salam and also the coming days, uh, the birth of the 12th Imam. Uh, it's a blessed month uh, by itself. Uh, the month of Shaban is a preparation for the month of Ramadan. And for sure, uh, these are the chances that we have in order to get ourselves purified. Um, and when the, when the soul is purified, when the heart is purified, Automatically, the behaviors, the words, the the the, the, the speech, uh, and the, the etiquette, everything that we do, reflect that, and it's the vice versa. And we have the opposite. Unfortunately, the heart is not as its best level of purification and um, transparency. Uh, then we have problems in our behaviors, in our communications with people. Um, well, uh, this fifth session, in previous sessions, we talked about uh, the general outlook of Islam and, I mean, religion and morality. Uh, in the first session, we talked about, about different ways that we can res- understand the relationship between the two, uh, especially in comparison with other religions as well. Also, in the second session, we talked about, um, if I remember correctly, we talked about different approaches that are there in Islamic tradition towards morality and how uh, Muslim scholars, in the broadest sense of the word, have approached moral issues and uh, moral discussions in different sciences and different disciplines and traditions. In the third session and also fourth session, we went through some of the cases and instances of uh, that moral thing. In the third session, we talked about the stages of moral uh, journey 
the journey of the self self building. And then in the fourth session, we talked about uh, the instances and cases of moral advice in uh, especially Shia heritage in Vasa'al Shia. If you remember, I brought the book and we couldn't even finish the list of the titles of the chapters. And uh, this session, uh, I thought maybe it's good that we have a little bit of, a little bit of analysis uh, because, uh, and a little bit of serious discussion, uh, talking about things that uh, people might have in their minds, and they might think that they are a little bit controversial. And that is uh, the common moral errors associated with religiosity. Huh? Now, this sounds a bit interesting uh, because if, when we talk about morality and religion always, uh, these topics are brought up sometimes, uh, sometimes even automatically they, uh, they raise. And that is, the how religious people sometimes how they act in a way that is not expected from a religious person but before arriving there uh, we have to talk about certain terminology and we have to arrive at certain uh, agreements on what we mean by different words and then we discuss about these issues that actually uh, we have to address them and there's a proverb in Farsi that says if if you want to criticize another person well it doesn't say that literally literally it says if you want to poke another person with a needle try to do that the same action with yourself but even at least in a very lower level huh? so if you want if we want to uh, criticize or if you want to have a critical thinking about other people, it's always best to do at least part of it for ourselves, huh? to address it, to address the issue in our communities, in ourselves, the things that we have. So before that, uh, we have to consider certain things. Uh, one is, what do we mean by religiosity? Now, this is very important because uh, there are different senses of the word, and there are different levels of this. You see some people, they are not very practicing, but they consider themselves very religious. And you see some people, they are practicing, but they say, no, you're not religious. I, me? Me? No, I'm not religious at all, for example. But he is practicing at all. And then um, this is one thing about it. And then some people, they have... A certain understandings of, of religiosity. For example, for them, religiosity means if only you do certain things, you are considered religious. Otherwise, no. And this discussion is as old as Islam itself. Since the beginning of Islam, uh, we had different groups and big controversies over what it means to be a follower of Islam. If you know, uh, one of the first and earliest uh, disagreements and conflicts among Muslim groups and then theologians and then leaders was over uh, the state of the sinners. Uh, like what happens when a person sins? Is he still a Muslim or is he not a Muslim? And if he is a Muslim, how can we say that a person committing sin is a Muslim? Uh, so you had Khawarij on one side who would say that uh, those committing sins, especially major sins, they are out of the fold of Islam. And uh, some of them, even some of the far extreme side of that group, they would say that we have the duty either to stop them or to annihilate them. And this was the case of Khawarij. And then we have Murja who would say, doesn't matter how much sin you commit, you're still a Muslim, and Islam is only just a word. You say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad and Muhammad, and then you're in the fold of Islam, and the rest is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are we to judge people? Huh? And this sounds a bit 
uh, nice that we shouldn't judge people. We shouldn't say that uh, this is wrong or right. No, no judgment, nothing. Leave it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is this was Murja. And then uh, we had the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt that no, Islam is a combination of different things. A sinner is not an infidel or kafir or faithless. And at the same time, it's not the ideal state. It doesn't mean that Islam doesn't have that practical aspect. A person is inside Islam as long as he has that belief in the heart and also expresses that. But then there are uh, shortcomings. There are uh, there are cases that people fall short, uh, but that doesn't make them outside the fold of Islam. And in one beautiful hadith, uh, the Imam says, the case of committing a sin is like a person who takes off his shirt. Uh, he takes off the, the, the shirt, the, the clothes of Iman, faith, and then he puts it on, on again. So religiosity, uh, there are different levels of it, and we have to be aware of it. And certain levels of religiosity, people use it in a negative sense. Like, for example, that person is a hardliner, for example, or is a radical, for example. And uh, some people, sometimes the application of the term is true. Sometimes it is not. It is just an exaggeration. We should be careful uh, about the use of the words that are there. People with different motivations use these terminology in different senses. We don't want to enter that discussion. Just we want to be aware that these things are there. And then on the other side, morality also is like that. Uh, morality, sometimes there is a loose sense of the word that anything that even might look not very acceptable, they, uh, certain groups try to make it appear as moral. And uh, it's very possible that throughout like the years, you see that uh, the values change sometime in a way that an, an act that used to be regarded as immoral now is moral. And then all of a sudden people decide to label it differently. Uh, we should also remember that as well. But with certain moral values, like for example, sacrifice, we are not talking about the extent of sacrifice. There are certain extent of sacrifice that are not acceptable, uh, like uh, harming yourself unnecessarily. No, no, we are talking about the common cases of like acts of charity, for example. Sometimes you uh, go through a little bit of difficulty in order uh, to give somebody something that he needs, for example. These little sacrifices that we all agree that are moral. Uh, so we talk about them and we want to talk about the relationship between them or respecting the rights of others. That we all agree that if something is established as a right of another person, like the dignity that the person has, for example, do, we, do I have the right to, to disrespect that in, in front of others, either in his absence or in his presence? Things that we all agree now uh, that are considered moral issues, moral acts, moral behavior. So what's the relationship between the two? Now, uh, let me list uh, things according to the, uh, let's categorize the advantages and disadvantages of religiosity in morality. Mm, that, that, that sounds better if you follow a certain order. So what are the advantages of religiosity in morality? Now, one advantage that you all know is that if everything is functioning well, okay, we are not talking about the case of hypocrites. We are not talking about the case of those who don't believe in the day of judgment in reality, but they appear, they make it appear as if they believe. No, no, we are talking about those who really believe in the day of judgment. Judgment, but uh, it doesn't mean they are always aware of that. When you are always aware of the day of judgment, then that's another high level of religiosity. No, we are talking about those who generally believe that there is a day that you will be taken accountable for what you had done before. Um, now, the advantage of religiosity, the advantage of 
a special religiosity we mean islamic religiosity because there are certain religions that don't believe in the day of judgment or there are certain religions that believe that on the day of judgment we will be winner we will be the winners no matter what we did to other followers of other ideologies now these people exist they think that because we are the chosen uh, group of people uh, it doesn't matter how we treat other followers of other ideologies on the day of judgment, if there is any day of judgment or the hereafter, then uh, God is going to treat us like his children. Quran addresses these people as those who say, They would say that we are the loved ones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't matter how we behave in this life, okay? Not towards him, not towards other, doesn't matter at all. Because at the end of the day, we are the children of God, and then God is going to uh, favor us over the rest of his creation, even if we had done injustice to them all, because they did not deserve uh, that status that we have. Uh, but this is not there. We know that, I mean, in Islam, it's not there. We know that in Islam, even if you mistreat a follower of another religion doesn't matter what religion he is if you mistreat that person if it is a case of dhulm and injustice you will be brought to justice and you should be accountable for for, for the for the things injustice that you had done even to those who are not the followers of your ideology so this is established fact in islam now the advantage of believing in such a concept of the day of judgment is clear in morality. Uh, that moral accountability is not just for this world. Some people say we should act morally not because of the consequences. If you act because if you act morally because of the consequences, it's not actually a moral behavior it's a legal behavior well that is not a very bad judgment it's it's true true moral behavior is when you act morally without any expectation of reward or without any fear of punishment and we have it in our tradition in our teachings i mean in islamic teachings that that is the highest level of faith that you do things not because of the fear of the punishment, not because of the expectation or longing for the rewards. No, you do it just for the sake of God, just not even sometimes for the sake of God. It might sound uh, a bit surprising to you, but it is there. We have this, that even a person who has certain moral values, certain moral principles, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I love this moral value so much that even if a person does it not for me but does it because of his own karama because of his own self-esteem because he sees himself this much valuable that he, he does not pollute himself with these things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward him one of them is sahaba generosity one of them is uh, good manners with one's family like we have it in a case in a war that there was a captive uh, who, who, who had been captured by Muslim army and the prophet said you should free this person and they said how we, we captured him in a war and we should take ransom it's not for free the prophet said no Jabrail brought uh, the message for me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this person is nice with his family and Allah loves that and he wants to reward him for that the, the guy was a mushrik faithless but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that or there is a hadith I mean we have this hadith uh, or might be several hadith that even a person even if a person uh, uh, abstain from uh, alcoholic beverages like uh, or, or uh, toxicating agents in general and uh, even if he does it not for the sake of a god not because of the religion he, he he doesn't have any regard for any religion but he doesn't do it because of his own self-esteem because of his own character Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward him for that on the day of judgment so we have this that certain moral values Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers them valuable in themselves without 
any kind of ideology or belief or anything. And uh, those people who say do not reduce morality to punishment and reward, they are right. We should not reduce morality to punishment and reward. But uh, the thing is, a complete and perfect moral and legal system should have something for everyone. What does it mean? It means that, yes, you have some people who act morally regardless of the punishment and reward, but not everyone is like that. And if your system doesn't have any room for those people who are not like that, you, you have a failed system. You have an imperfect system, either legal or moral system. So it's a bit like fantasy to say that because we don't want to reduce morality to punishment and reward, let's just not talk about punishment and reward at all. No, it is not realistic and it is not practical, uh, especially with the majority of people. Uh, if it were the case, you wouldn't have cases of fine or, or, or I don't know, having bills at the door of your home when you do something wrong in traffic or anything like that. This is the way that the order is preserved. Uh, unfortunately, unfor if some people blame it on the educative uh, education system, like for example, if we had like an education system, a perfect that could bring up people, I don't know who is to blame here, but uh, let's face the reality. Anyway, so the punishment and reward, they have their pragmatic, practical, and serious role in the behavior of people. Now, if a person has, as I said, we're not talking about hypocrites, we're not talking about those who have wrong understandings, like there might be some people who have an understanding of the day of judgment, that on the day of judgment, we will be taken to God no matter of what we did on earth. No, no. People will be questioned. Yara, this is the teaching of Quran. Yara, the slightest, the smallest thing that you can imagine. If a person does something which is evil, shar, yara, we will see it. See, not see the consequence of it. If we see that thing, the reality of that thing on the day of judgment. May Allah forbid, may Allah save us. So, um, that mentality, that consciousness of eternal accountability for your behavior is honestly a big advantage of religiosity and morality. And nobody can deny that. People bring in certain things that why that person who is religious does that. Well, as I said, we are not talking about infallible people. We are talking about a variable, a factor in itself. We talk about other factors that come to play with religiosity that bring some disadvantages. But this is an advantage by itself, that it gives the pe people generally a kind of consciousness of that even if nobody is here, even if nothing happens, then uh, what I do will not be missed. Ya bunayya inna anta ko mithqala habbatan min khardalin fatakun fi sama of al-ardi atibah Allah. If I have recited the verse correctly, Luqman told his son, O oh son, if there is one little seed, either underneath the earth or on the heaven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring it on the day of judgment. Don't think that you said something and it finished. No, nothing finishes here. Nothing goes to nothingness. Everything is, is preserved. Uh, and everything, now, if, if you recite Quran, one third of Quran approximately, approximately is about the day of judgment and the fact that on the day of judgment, everything, nothing major or minor will be missed. And it gives great uh, consciousness to people. And I have seen this for people who truly believe in the Day of Judgment, how they are observant of the rights of others, because they know how serious it is uh, respecting the rights of others. This is one advantage. 
And now let's go to the disadvantage and think if there are other advantages as well. I think no bigger advantage is from this, the consciousness of accountability uh, on the day of judgment, which is an eternal accountability and which is something that you cannot get away with. Another thing uh, on the list of disadvantages, I thought about this and maybe you have thought as well and you can contribute to the discussion because this is something we have to address in our communities. And we have to accept that there are certain moral shortcomings that are common in religious communities, let's say, in our communities. And we have to find the roots of them. What are the roots of these things? The thing that had come to my mind is, that, and this is not actually something I think it's not, I'm not the first person to have uh, come up with this diagnosis. Uh, I will tell you why I believe uh, this has been preceded by another, I mean, by a greatest scholar. If I say another scholar, it gives a sense that, no, it's greatest scholar. He said this in a different uh, field, but I think it's applicable here as well. And that is, uh, when you believe in Islam, and uh, you truly believe it's the right ideology. This is something that you can, uh, I mean, you have to you have to feel it. It's not something that I can tell you. When you read the words of the Holy Quran and then you realize now this is the final revelation to mankind. And uh, it's something personal, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that you have to have it or, no, I'm just saying this is a certain state of the soul or a spirit that a person reaches that Atminan, Atminan means when you are settled on something. Your heart is settled. It's not because of the how people look at you. It's not because of your fame or anything. No, it's when you are settled on something that you have the right faith and you're on the right path. Then it gives you a state of self-satisfaction. And in our tradition, we, we call it ojb, for example, that, okay, now we are done. We are, what else is there that we should follow? We are on the right path. What is there for us to do? This is at the level of the belief. And then at the level of practice, the wrong mentality, this, this one is wrong. The wrong mentality that people have, and that is, okay, when I do my wajibat, obligatory acts of worship, for example, then nothing else I should do. And this also increases that ojb, that self-satisfaction, that uh, regard that you have for yourself. Now, I, I believe in the right ideology and then I am doing the right acts and now this is the sort this state of being satisfied with yourself being pleased with yourself is the source of all other problems and moral issues and there is a fine line between being proud of your faith and then at the same time being suspicious about yourself this is very important some people, and many people, they can't appreciate the line between the two. They think if they want to be observant of their behavior, it means that they have to always challenge their faith and value system, the generalities and the principles, which could not be taking place for a person consistently because this itself is a value that you have that I, I want to, to criticize myself always and always. Do you want to criticize yourself or the belief system? Maybe your understanding of that belief system is wrong. Yes, this one, we should have it. Always you should challenge your understanding of the Holy Quran, of the principles of faith that are there. But some people don't appreciate the difference. They always 
regard themselves as the infallible mind and start criticizing the principles of faith. You see, there's the difference. These people, in fact, they are even more selfish because they think they are the center of the universe. Whatever that they understand is true, whatever that they, they don't understand is false. So bring to me the truth and everything that I don't understand is false. Now you should always be humble and give some room for things that you don't understand, okay? This is the, this is the sign of a wise person. That sometimes I try to understand, but there are certain things that I don't understand because because of different things, because of the education, because of the that preparation that your soul should have in order to understand certain things, and the list goes on. So there is a fine line between uh, being hopeless and disappointed, and uh, like being always in depression and negative mood of everything. No, no, that is not, that is not tawada. That is something else. And always being self-centered. Self-centrism or narcissism or selfishness or being pleased with oneself, it could be understood like the, the, the first words that I said, narcissism, they are always negative. But being pleased with yourself also, there are different senses of it. If you say, for example, let's get back to religiosity. If I say, okay, this religion, I have arrived at the point that I know that this religion is right. It doesn't mean that I am the fullest, at the fullest understanding of this religion. It doesn't mean... I am the best practitioner of, of this religion. It doesn't mean that even I think a person asked this from one of the imams that when I pray, because he was uh, worried about the ujb, being pleased with oneself. He said, for example, when I do some acts of worship, when I do some good act, charities, acts of charity, for example, acts of kindness to others, uh, I become happy. Is it wrong that I become happy? The one says, no. If you become happy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the tawfiq, if you become happy that I did something right and, and it was through the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I could do it, then yes, that could be a step forward. Like for example, if let me give you an example of ordinary life. For example, you study hard and you get a good result in the test. You become happy automatically. But you know this is the result of working hard. If you don't know this, you become too proud of yourself and you don't study for the next exam and you fail. That's the problem. If you know that what you did was because you listened to the word of God and then God helped you, gave you tawfiq, and then you could perform this act of worship, prayer, or anything, helping others. If you see that connection, then there is no problem. As a matter of fact, it gives you and it makes you more humble towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're seeing yourself as uh, owing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? Now, one of the another factors of uh, the distinction is this, that if you see yourself as having some minna on Allah, and you, as if, as if, may Allah so forbid, Allah owes you something. Now I did this. I, I prayed. For example, now I'm expecting something happened in my life. For example, I did this act of charity and now I'm expecting something to happen. This is the position of self-centrism. Like you see yourself as uh, that, for example, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owes you something. Uh, this is an indication of, of the wrong understanding of the situation. And that is the source of all problems, moral problems as well like a spiritual problems and the, such a person is, starts behaving with others, the term that in English they say holier than though, like as if I'm a greater person. You don't know what kind of night prayer, Salatul Layl I performed last night. Who knows? I'm the closest servant of Allah. So now the moment a person has this perception, this is Sunnah Allah, the tradition of Allah. The moment a person has this thing in mind, 
Now he falls in a way spiritually uh, that not always, but mostly it happens. And this is a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a person not to continue in the path. Or for example, uh, I wanted to say something I forgot, but this ujb, this ujb is the source of all moral issues that we see. Let's say not all, but almost all moral issues that we see in our community. This auntie, this uncle in the community, you see them start making some toxic comments about others, passing judgments like <laughs> like automatic machine gun, like judgments after judgments, and how artistically they can pass a judgment with one sentence, like three judgments in one sentence about the person. How could you do that even? Uh, may Allah forbid. I also, I, I, I do not like say that I'm not in that category. Unfortunately, it happens to all of us. And when you think about it, you realize that it stems mostly from the fact that you think you are in that position. Religiously, I'm the person who has prayed, who has come to masjid for 20 years. Now, these 20 years of masjid coming gives me the authority to pass such judgments about others. See, this is odd. A person thinks that he did something, it was good, but he thinks he did it because of himself. He thinks that he did it and uh, this gives him that special position that he can say who is closer to Allah and then tell us about Alam al Ghaib, for example. But we don't have any of these. You see, the interesting part is that those who knew the most from Alam al Ghaib, who were they? The Imams, the Prophet. They knew the most about the realities of people. It was like if just a second they wanted, they could see the malakut of a person, who this person really is. But they were the most normal person and moral person in their behavior with others. This is very, uh, I don't know what to say, interesting, astonishing. Now, there's a hadith that says, Lauta ka shafto mata If you knew about each other, you wouldn't even bury each other. Uh, it is a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he keeps your secret hidden from one another. If you knew each other, you would hate each other so much that you wouldn't even bury each other. But the Prophet وسلم, and the Imams, they knew many things. If they wanted to know, they could know. But they wouldn't act as if like I'm superior to you or pass judgments. And sometimes this self-centerism, this ujb that is rooted in the good acts that we perform sometimes. This results in a misunderstanding of certain obligations that we have. One common case is the misunderstanding between an-nahi an al-munkar wa ta'yir. It's very important. And some of the scholars actually have stated this explicitly. That an-nahi an al-munkar doesn't or shouldn't have ta'yir in it or shouldn't have tajassus in it, disrespecting the privacy of others. Why? Because I want to do nahi al-munkar. Nahi al-munkar to begin with, to start, was not about the privacy or the private parts of people, private zones of people's lives. Nahi al-munkar is about the public zone. And public zone has different levels, layers. Uh, there are certain things that are public in the layer of the family and the uh, relatives, for example. There are certain things that are public in the workplace, uh, public in that you shouldn't mix everything with everything. If something is public at the level of the family, you should address it there only. Uh, yes, it is something that should be addressed. Nahyan al-Munkar could, could take place at the level of the family because a person has brought up a sin at the level of the family, and then you have to stand against it. But even when you stand against the sin, you don't have the right to pass judgment. You don't have the right to say that I am better than him or he is worse than me. You're, you're, you don't have the right to 
Even think about the personality of the person. You should hate the act and love the person. That's the, that's the point. He is a believer. He is a fellow Muslim. He is a fellow faithful person. And uh, but he had this shortcoming, this this problem, this is act of sin, and I have to stop again. Now, you can think and you can imagine how many cases of Ahya al Munkar have you seen that is like this, that is against the act and not the person. Unfortunately, we tend to make things always personal. We can't show it in our behavior that my brother i have respect for you i have regard for you and truly because of this respect i want you not to do this in in the gathering for example in front of others in public huh how could we convey this message to the to, to the person on the other hand unfortunately we see cases of a person as i said passing judgments ta'ir. now he is the person doing that and this and sometimes even they don't uh, explicitly say that in Arabic. They say, uh, when, when you don't say something explicitly and implicitly, just uh, try to address it. It's sometimes even worse because the mind of the, the person, the listener, goes to many different places. Like, for example, when you say, let me not open the can of the worms. Well, what is that kind of the worms? <laughs> there are many things that people create in their imagination. That's even worse than saying, okay, let me not talk about his smoking. For the smoking, you said can of the worms or other things that are there. May Allah forbid. So uh, we see this, unfortunately, in our communities that, and one of these are one of the taswilat of the soul. Taswil means um, there is, there's a function of the human soul that tries to decorate what he does. For example, I am jealous. And this is an act of pure jealousy. But my soul doesn't want to accept that this is jealousy. So he decorates it or covers it with religious cover. The soul, my subconscious, decorates it with the cover of what? Um, Nahyan al Munkar, for example. No, I'm doing Nahyan al Munkar. It's not jealousy. It's not the grudges that I had from against this person from 10 years ago. No, this is this is very complicated. If a person is not honest with himself, uh, he starts developing this. I mean, his subconscious starts developing this thing of decoration of the acts to the point that he doesn't even realize the reality of the acts that he does or the comments that he makes. He starts telling himself that this comment, I made it only because of Nahi and al Munkar. And, and, and then he believes it. And then if you want to raise the awareness of that person, no, this is not that because it doesn't have the characteristic of Nahi and al Munkar in Islam. And it has all the characteristics of Ta'ayir, which is uh, which is denied in Islam, which is which has been forbidden in Islam, ta'ayir, that you uh, make a statement about another person, make a comment about another person, when you have the feeling that I am better than him. I'm not the kind of person who does that. Hmm? Who is the kind of person? How could you do that? You start blaming a person for something uh, that he did no, you, you shouldn't blame it in a sense that, no, this is completely, no, this, you always should say, I seek refuge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask for forgiveness for myself and for you, the brother, and I, I, I want you to stop doing this. And in a way that the person sees that you're actually uh, even kind, like more kind than uh, himself. It's impossible, but you want to show this kindness to him, that you're you're asleep, you don't understand. Please wake up and understand that this is wrong. This is against your fetra. Even if you you, you think about it, you, you realize that this is wrong. So this is one advantage and one disadvantage. One advantage was that consciousness of the hereafter, which I believe is a very strong factor in bringing people into moral consciousness. And then... 
disadvantage was what? Was that sense of ujb and uh, being proud, which is right. The, the scholar that I said uh, preceded this, and maybe uh, this idea started in my, in my mind after reading his work, is Ayatollah Shahabadi, who was the Irfani teacher and master, Suluki teacher of Imam Khomeini. Ayatollah Muhammad Ali Shahabadi, great scholar. And uh, he has a book, Shadaratul Ma'arat. In his book, he says, one of the sources of backwardness of Muslims or even Shia is that satisfaction, the state of satisfaction with the belief that they have. Once they tell themselves, okay, we are on the right path and then we're going to see all the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, then what else should we do on earth? Huh? What? Uh, why should we bother even with building society, building a civilization or anything? And this is one reason, he says, one reason for the backwardness of our communities. So this started uh, the idea in my mind that this is the source of all problems. The, the, the idea that you are already there, the idea that you don't need any you don't need to make any improvement because you're already, you have already achieved what you wanted to achieve. And uh, there is a hadith, we, we should talk about this. I mean, we address, I think we addressed this in one of the sessions that uh, if you remember Imam al-Rida, the session that we had around close to the anniversary birthday of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, the long hadith that said there are more values. And at the end of that hadith, Imam al-Rida said, uh, seeing yourself, Al-Ashara wa mal ashara what is the 10th the, the moral value, is that to see yourself the lowest in comparison to all creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a, a theme of discussion by itself, that your spiritual status has close connection to the way you see yourself. If you see yourself as much as you see yourself higher, you're lower in spirituality. And as much as you see yourself lower, you're higher in spirituality. And the Imams and the Prophets, they had this and they're having this, that they see always themselves as the lowest of the law in front of Allah SWT, and they see other creatures always better than them. But they don't mix it with the obligations that they have. Okay, I'm the lowest of the law, but I have the obligation to stop the sin, to stop the problems. A completely the opposite. We see ourselves as the highest and then we, do, we don't do our, our obligations in uh, trying to, to, to stop the evil things that are there in society. Okay, this is uh, what I think we could talk about. I had prepared two hadiths for tonight. Um, I think uh, I will not do justice if I just read them now. Maybe we postpone them for the next session related to this discussion as well. The, uh, the distinction between Ada of religiosity, acts of religiosity that has, that have become like a habit for a person and that they are not indicators of any status of a person. And then uh, true tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that show true level of the uh, spiritual richness of a person. Uh, if there are questions or contributions or comments, please, uh, we will hear them. Thanks, uh, thank you so much, Adir Sheikh, for that uh, talk on a very important topic, of course. Uh, yeah, so this uh, segment of the webinar, just the final uh, five to ten minutes, inshallah, will be the question and answer session. Uh, I do have a few questions from the viewers. The first question I have is that, uh, do you think the decrease uh, in morality in this day and age is, uh, uh, is in correlation with the increase uh, in technology? It's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, well, th there is a common cause for both of them. I, I, if we want to talk about in the language of Islamic literature, there is a concept of qaswatul qalb, uh, the hardening of the heart. Uh, yes. I believe the, the decline of moral values 
the fact that uh, many evil things take place in front of uh, us and we have been desensitized about them uh, helps in the creation of that qaswatul qalb in us uh, that uh, many things have been normalized to us and uh, in different levels I start from the relationship between mahram and namahram now in the past the chances that people had for having a relationship between mahram and namahram how, how much was that but now it's just uh, some clickers away I start from that to the uh, the violence that you're exposed to or uh, or the the industrial society or the civil inattention that if you are civilized you should you should not pay attention to things that are taking place you should just care about your own position in the society so everything have been gathered in order to create that hardening of the soul and once the hardening of the heart once the qaswat al-qalb is there so there are certain things that are the root of other immoral issues one of them was oj the other is qaswat al-qalb and I think technology had a major role in hardening of the hearts of people. Yes. Santa, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next question, just try to uh, get through the questions before we wrap up uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, is that uh, do you think the current Western uh, society and the Western culture is aligned uh, with the morality that uh, Islam teaches? Uh, well, in there are certain things that, yes, uh, because they are principles of morality in all humanity, and it's not that much easy to pass a judgment about the whole Western society. But there are certain parts that we can say for sure no. Uh, the, the, the absence of a God, but not the Jiddu Christian God, uh, a God of Quran both Rahim and at the same time Hakim, uh, with all the names that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in Quran. The absence of such a God in that general civilization uh, plays a big role in the distinction between two moralities. The morality of the Western society is more objective, more uh, business-based ba and results-oriented, which are good things of it, results-oriented. But at the same time, it lacks that uh, ability to address issues that are uh, hidden in the soul of the person when it comes to uh, real issues of spirituality like the state of uh, for example the meaning of life in general in the secular aspect of the world like we know that thinkers like Russell and other uh, I'm not saying all Western society is faithless but these people have a, a greater voice in that society especially among the educated people uh, when they they couldn't they couldn't come up with a meaning of life at the end of the day if you go to nothingness after death then why should you bother to uh, follow certain morals it's only for the sake of civilization and sometimes civilization teaches you to be the stronger and then just get your right and so uh it's difficult to pass a general judgment but no for sure there are disagreements that are there that are principled that are uh, decisive Uh, thank you so much. And the final question uh, is, of course, in relation to uh, the topic. And also, you know, it is difficult to uh, for children uh, to you know grow up in the uh, Western societies in the Western culture uh, that is uh, sort of uh, uh, diluting the idea of morality, morality and demonizing the Islamic uh, values. Uh, so, what sort of advice can you give to the parents uh, in uh, order to you know raise their children uh, with the, the morality that uh, Islam teaches? Yeah, it's very complicated um, because uh, it's not something we can do easily. It's something that uh, if you want to fake, there are certain things that they say fake it and then you can make it. But this thing, it's not like that. You can't fake it. You have to have it. You have to. Uh, children should see that moral things and behavior and values in your behavior. Uh, I think 
the root of the thing is that sense of attachment that we have to keep with our children and sense of con companionship owns i don't know what's the good, good word for that in english and our children are spending a lot of time with other people and they have companionship with many different things and it's really natural that they develop a kind of attachment to them and if you wake up late you realize that uh, then when you are, they are like for example teenagers they are attached to other things than you uh, we should be careful these attachments are created when you have quality time with people a mother came to me i think and he said like for example why i don't have a good relationship with my daughter i said how much time do you spend with your daughter he said we eat like for example every day and then I said, no, I'm talking about quality time. You see, you, you spend like two hours a day at the maximum with your daughter. Your daughter spends 12 hours with other things that she loves more. Uh, how could you replace that with your daughter? For example, you spend, if not 12 hours, but two hours quality time. Like you have shared experiences that you all enjoy and your daughter has these pictures of you and her having this experience. It's very important that whatever we do, Okay, that moral teaching is another step, because if you jump there and you don't have this attachment, this companionship, it doesn't work if it if it it's not working in the opposite direction. You have to first build that companionship and owns. even the prophet when he wanted to affect people, he first built that owns with people. It is owns that brings everything after. If you don't have that once, that companionship with anyone, your children, your wife, your spouse, you can't make a good impression. So uh, first, let's build that. And then once we build that, uh, then uh, if we have that companionship with Quran as well, for example, this shows itself in our behavior as well. This is a very general thing. It needs uh, more specific details, but this is, I think, the principle of it. Asant, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that uh, concludes the time that we have uh, for today's uh, webinar. Reminder to the viewers that until the 15th of March, uh, these weekly webinars will take uh, place uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. as opposed to the usual 6 to 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, but inshallah, after the 15th, the uh, normal time of 6 p.m. will resume. Uh, and again, thank you so much, uh, dear Sheikh, for joining us. Uh, so to the viewers, inshallah, I hope to see you again uh, next week uh, with the, you know, the same topic with a different guest, inshallah. Uh, so for me, the moderator, Sayyid Mahdi Abidin, our dear guest, Hujat al-Islam wal muslimin uh, Dr. Sheikh Hussein Latifi, I'd like to uh, bid you farewell, inshallah, and hope to see you again soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.